Anything like me, the best friend you've had in your entire life couldn't possibly understand a word you said unless it was treat or ball. Dogs, an invaluable part of any life, have captured the attention and hearts of people all across the globe. They come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, which is pretty incredible considering that their ancestors are rather monotone. But have you ever wondered what causes such a variety in the appearance of our beloved friends? Today, at the sake of boring you to death, to death, fingers crossed that I don't, I'm going to delve into the interesting and highly technical world that is canine genetics. Being the daughter of one of the top golden beetle breeders in both the state and the country, not to toot her own horn here, but I've grown up with genetics and stuff like this for my entire life. I think I'm pretty qualified to talk about this. So genes are important for dog breeding, and if I eventually want to take over my family business and make the most beautiful and genetically healthy dogs that I can, I better know what I'm doing. And besides, this is my major. I should know what I'm talking about at least a little bit. So for you, my dear doggy loving audience, this pertains to you because if you've ever looked at your furry breast friend and wonder why they look the way they do, then this speech is for you. Today, sit back, relax, and let me lay down some sick genetics information. I'm going to be talking about coat colors and all the crazy genes you have to keep track of when you're trying to see what potential colors and patterns are for a dog, that, and ones that they could carry for as well. And then, here's a spoiler, there's a lot to keep track of. Then, I'll let you in on some inside information as to the genetics behind coat textures and shedding factor in dog breeds. And lastly, I'll talk about genetic diseases and sad stuff like that that could be prevented if careful breeding is implemented to a person's program. So first, I'm going to break down some technical terms, and then I'll go into coat coloring for dogs. And then lastly, well, there's no lastly. That's all I'm going to do. There are many genes that one has to keep track of when it comes to figuring out what coat colors can be born to any two dogs that have puppies. You can kind of imagine like a dog like a canvas, and their genes like the paints, and then the breeder like the artist. So, dog genetics .co.uk does a wonderful job spelling out the different genes and most of all, spelling out the terminology behind what means what. So, for your crash course of genetics, try not to have flashbacks to high school bio, please. All creatures have DNA and at least RNA, but those fun strings of deoxyribose nucleic acid contain genes, which are basically the instructions for one's physical traits. And since all genes aren't the same and biologically things have to get crazy and switch it up, alleles become a thing that there is some variation from organism to organism. That explains why, for instance, if you have you have brown dogs, yellow dogs, black dogs, and everything in between. And a term that I'll be throwing around a lot will be loci or locus, which is basically where a gene is loca located on a particular DNA strand. The location of a particular sequence determines what is and what <laughs> what it is and what really used for identification purposes. Are you having fun yet? No. Well. Uh, hold on to your hats, because I'm almost done with this boring explanation bit. In genes, there are ones that can be classified as dominant or recessive, which are exactly what they sound like. A dominant gene will mask the recessive one if they're both present. If it's a recessive gene, then that trait will... If it's all recessive, then that trait will show. Goodness, sorry, a little sick, kind of going all over the place. There's also such a thing as incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Incomplete dominance shows a blending of both traits, while co-dominant shows both traits, say, like spotting patterns in cows, for example. So, that's it for the crash course. Now we can move on to the fun stuff. So, let's go on to coat color. There's a lot of loci that I play into a Fupri Duber's coloration. And the company, Vetgen, who I had the wonderful opportunity to visit in May, does a wonderful job explaining the combinations that will determine the final ratios of color for potential puppers. So, there's some basic loci that one has to focus on, called simply the B and E loci. These will potentially code for colors of cream, black, and brown, which are the main ones we're going to focus on today. There are also A and K loci that have, maybe, uh, have to be paid attention to when figuring out color combinations in future letters. So, let's start with popping up our little chart here. So, we have this, which is BetGen's official chart of coat colors and fun stuff like that. So you have the black one here. See the big B, big B? That means that's all dominant. Big B, big E, all dominant. You can only get cream if you have all little E's like this. Otherwise, it's going to be black or it's going to be brown. So, that being said, if a dog has two little E's in their gene, it means they'll display a color range from cream to red, since they can only express the cream gene. Anything else will be determined by Gen X and Locus K and the combination of genes there. Depending on what is present or not, 
A dog could go to the bee locus for its traits or display either black or brown. Black would be big B, big B, or big B, little B, and brown is little B, little B. The last bit determining basic coat coloring would be the A locus where a dog can be determined as sable pattern or the recessive black, which one or one with tan points. There's also a D locus, which is for dilution, and that will determine how strong the coat color will be and if it will fade up. So, yeah, dog coat coloring is complicated and hard to keep track of. That's why a lot of breeders and geneticists have a color chart like the one I've just been showing off. So to review, there's a lot of crazy terms to keep track of, like the genes, alleles, and loci, and various forms of dominance to keep track of as well. There's also, that's not even getting into the scientific bits of it. It's a crazy web of potential coat colors that one has to keep track of in order to fully decipher the Rosetta Stone of genes that could potentially be displayed in a litter of puppies. So enough enough about coat color though. Let's move on to the part we really care about. The texture and why some puppies are so fuzzy and soft while others kind of fall flat. So for this part, I'm going to be talking about some much simpler genes and why some dogs are curly, why some are wavy, why some are flat, and why the heck is all this hair everywhere? So according to VetGen, again, I love them, curliness is a mutated gene in dogs. The and they say mutation is a dominant one. So breeds where the coat can be either curly or not, it is possible for a curly dog to carry the non-curly trait. So the symbols for curl and straight, or non-curly as they call it, can be represented by a plus symbol for curly and a minus symbol for straight. Meaning if a dog was plus plus for curl, then they would have no straight coat gene anywhere in their DNA and couldn't possibly have any offspring, offspring with straight coats. Offspring, goodness. To elaborate on that, in the interview I had with them, they mentioned a lot that poodles with a coat coloration of party, which is partially white, carried a single gene for a straight coat. That meant, say, if one of those poodles that was bred with a dog that carried straight coat gene, as a golden retriever does, they half the litter would be estimated to have straight coats. Though there is a lot of research to back this, there is also a matter of weighty coats, which I personally believe is an incomplete dominance trait thing, because there's kind of a blending of the curly and straight coats. They say that these dogs will curl up, but I haven't seen that happen yet. These dogs will always show the genotype or the technical term of what the genes are, so those will always be plus and the minus symbol together. So now that you had to, yeah, now some of you may have had to deal with the issue of shedding when it comes to your dog, I can explain why there's such a lack or abundance of best friend residue. And finally, two different genes that are responsible for the shedding factor in canines. This first gene that VetGen goes over for the shed factor is called furnishings. If a dog, well, what furnishing it is, is like kind of like if you look at a dog and see the fluffiness by their eyes and on their muzzle and stuff, that's it. If there's a lot of it, then that means they're probably not going to shed. If it's very thin or non-existent, they're probably going to have a straight face, like very golden retriever-like, and shed a lot. So if there's two capillaps, which is what burnishing says, then little no shedding. And then, as I said, flat, lots of shedding. You're going to find a lot of hair all over your furniture, let me just say that. The other gene for shedding that Betjen discovered on is one that they discovered on their own, and for the sake of disclosure, I will not name it specifically. So let's call it the high shedding allele. As you can probably guess, what happens when you have two copies of a high shedding allele represented by plus and minus symbols? It's kind of the same as the furnishing genes, but kind of in the opposite sort of way. Like so, if you have two copies of a high shedding allele, your dog's going to shed a lot. But basically, those two genes work together to make a shedding scale that goes from one, zero to four and with zero being no shedding and four being a lot of dog residue. So the genes behind texture and shedding is a lot less complicated than those of color, but are incredibly important to know when you're trying to determine what textures of potential litters of puppies will look like. All fun colors and textures in dogs are great, and it's like such a happy-go-lucky time, we just have to be extremely careful when deciding what two dogs to match up. So I hate to kill the mood here, but let me be talking about some genetic disorders that can pop up in canines through breeding. And I'll talk about how hybridization can help. So, there's a lot of genetic disorders that can be avoided if genetic testing and careful breeding was done to prevent them from happening in certain dogs. Some issues can be prevented even through, on a physical trait level. If you've ever seen a dog with Merle pattern, they, well, if you've never seen them, let me describe them. They're beautiful. They have like these kind of cookies and cream color to them. These sweet little cuddle biscuits are wonderful and they have bright blue eyes and a lot of people really like look, so people would assume like, oh, let's just breed them together. Be great. Well, that's a really bad idea because doing that will cause all of the puppies 
from the resulting litter to be blind. And an article in Canine Genetics and Epidemiology, which was done by several authors, called 10 Inherited Disorder in Purebred Breeds, gave me a lot of insight into what certain diseases can be found in purebred dog breeds. It's been found that there is a lot of disease and disorders that can have some very specific dog-related issues. So hip and elbow dysplasia in a Bernese Mountain Dogs is very common because they just been bred to be beautiful and people didn't really pay attention to that and now the breeds kind of ruined forever in that sort of sense. So dysplasia is a trait that can be passed down through generations and it's a serious problem because like you have hip dysplasia then you can't really walk well. It's really really tragic but it's not just Bernese that get this issue. PRA which is progressive retinal atrophy is another genetic disorder that can affect dogs. The first breed diagnosed with that being Gordon Setters. And then what PRA is, is a genetic disorder that eventually leads to blindness in canines, and even cats too. And this also pertains to poodles, and I think it's in retrievers. It's in a lot of breeds. So if you have two dogs with that in their genetics, test it, test it, test it. Make sure that this will not be passed on to their puppies. And it's really sad to think about, with good breeding, you can avoid all of this. You can avoid so much of this. But the best way I've found to avoid this is hybridization. Since a lot of these genetic disorders are, are dog breed specific, if you throw in a different dog breed that doesn't carry for this trait at all, then you could solve that problem. You could get that out of their lines. Though you'd be creating a different dog breed, it would totally help with health related problems. Those dogs would lead happier lives and they could potentially be just as beautiful as the original breeds they came from. So, for instance, with hip dysplasia, um, if you throw in, say, make a Bernie Doodle. You have a Bernese Mountain Dog, cross it with a Poodle. Poodles usually have pretty good hips, so if you find one with excellent hips by Poodle standards, then you could take out that hip and elbow problem for the Bernese Mountain Dogs. And Bernie Doodles, if you've ever seen them, they are so cute. And I really, really think that it's a great way in order to make dogs healthier. But this concept is known as hybrid vigor, and it's basically saying when a hybrid of dogs is created, those hybrid offspring will have better health than a purebred dog, and those traits and disorders that have been bred into them for over generations will be lost to time. That being said, it's still important to check the genetic backgrounds of both parents for genetic disorders if you're planning on breeding. I mean, don't do it uneducated, right? So dog books can sometimes have genes that can give them and their offspring pretty crummy disorders. But they can be prevented if there's careful breeding and can be eradicated completely in some cases if hybridization can be involved. So, I finished boring you to death about rambling my passion in life. I suppose we should bring this dog talk to a close. I talked a whole dang lot about colors and technical mumbo jumbo, beginning and explained why some dogs are the colors that they are. I also chatted about coat texture, explaining why Fido is curly while other dogs are straighter. And I also talked a bit about shedding and why there's so much god dang hair everywhere in the house. Like, it's everywhere. I finished, and then I finished up by talking about how certain disorders can appear in a dog's genes and how they can be avoided. So now the next time you're confronted with your fuzzy friend at home, while they're slobbering all over your face, you can confidently say that you know why they are the way they are. Though I don't recommend you saying it out loud to your dog because you'll both seem crazy and your dog won't understand because you haven't mentioned ball or treat at least once in that moment of rambling.